So uh, let me show you just how this applies to this particular example that we are using before. So let's say um, we have this uh, equation of motion, the differential equation. And for now, let's uh, forget about this, uh, this um, the, the resistive term, and let's go back to the original question before. And what I am saying is this. I am saying instead of, instead of guessing this as the solution, I am going to guess this as the solution. Q of t is equal to Q naught times e to d, and then this is going to be a complex um, exponential. It's going to be imaginary number i times this same term we had before, omega t. Let's see if this is a solution. Let's uh, plug it in and see what we get. So uh, we plug this in here. Then uh, we get the double derivative. Q double derivative is equal to. So this outside the function doesn't change at all because now it's uh, um, you know, exponential. So each time you take a derivative from chain rule, you bring down this factor of i omega. So you have um, i omega squared times the original function you had before. So that would be q of t. So you get, oh, so this, um, so you know, this is the left-hand side. This is the right-hand side here. So we simply need to say i omega squared is equal to minus 1 over LC, and I squared is minus 1. So we say, end up with the omega squared is equal to 1 over LC. That's what we wanted. Right? Now, as you are staring at this, you might notice that something is a little bit off. Um, anything that's uh, troublesome with this particular guess? something that we spent a little bit of time talking about with this solution that you don't see here. Yes? I'm, I'm, you know, I got rid of the resistance term, so there's no resistance right now to deal with. I mean, this one didn't uh, account for any resistance here, so. I guess this the particular set of initial condition that I picked makes it harder for you to see. Let me shift to your initial condition a little bit. Imagine that if we are plotting Q as a function of time, so before what we were doing was we start out with this set t equals zero, Let's say, all right, we are going to shift our beginning position a little bit, and we are going to say my time equals zero is actually this point. This is at t equals zero. So we could say initially my charge is actually zero, and initially my current is some maximum value of current. Right? The previous solution that we are dealing with is equipped to handle that. You see that how? Yes? Right? When you plug in Q equals time equals zero, so that tells you A is equal to zero. But the solution doesn't need to be zero because I have this B here, right? Um, so you know, let the derivative be equal to this, that'll give you the value of B. So you get you know, omega B is equal to I max when you actually go through the calculation. Does the same approach work here? When you plug in time equals zero, uh, what do you see here? What do you see for Q naught? Yeah, when you try to plug that in, Q of t equals zero, um, you say, well, t is equal to zero, so this is one. So that's a Q naught 
that's equal to zero. So, um, well, Q naught is equal to zero. That doesn't look right. <laughs> what am I doing wrong? Well, you know what? Let's go ahead and um, do the next thing. Um, so what we would do here is we would say apply the second boundary condition, right? Let's try applying that and see what we get. Um, so I or dq dt is equal to, so here, dq dt is uh, I omega q naught times e to the i omega t, um, or you know, this is equal to one at t equals zero, um, is equal to the i max. Hey, my q is not equal to, my q naught is not equal to zero. Uh, according to this, I get q naught is equal to i max over i omega, or I guess minus i max, or minus the i imaginary number times the current i max over omega. Hey, it's not equal to zero. What gives? So, um, so this is the um, sort of a nuance <laughs> that you have to, uh, it does take a while to understand, that's why um, the standard curriculum doesn't cover it, I'm guessing. Uh, so when you start guessing complex exponential as your, um, as your uh, guess to a differential equation, what you have to intuitively get is your coefficients, they are, their domain is now complex. So this Q naught is actually a complex number. So before we are trying to impose a condition based on assuming this is a real number. That's why we said when t is equal to zero, this is equal to zero. So what we really have to say is this. Um, let me try to do it in different color. So with this boundary condition, what we are really trying to say is, well, take all of this, and all of this is actually a complex number of the thing. If we take the real part to it, then the real part is equal to zero. So this Q naught would be, uh, for this particular initial condition that we are trying to apply, our Q naught would be a purely imaginary number. And we do the same thing here. Um, to figure out, to apply this condition here, what we are saying is that um, uh, what we are saying is that we take all of this, and if we take the real part of this, that's equal to i max, and um, all of this makes sense. So because what we are saying is the real part of this i omega q naught is equal to i max. Because based on this, if we say it has no, q naught has no real part, it's all imaginary, then it's imaginary q naught, let me, you can express that as, I don't know, i times um, q naught real. Then, you know, this i kind of cancels out that i, and you get all real number. So, um, it's a bit of a sophisticated <laughs> mathematics. And we are going to use a little bit of this to help us solve through um, AC circuits. And frankly, a circuit like this, that's a little bit too complicated for us to solve using this. But let me just uh, give you a couple pointers to sort of help you navigate through um, the sort of set of topic that does you know, require more time to properly introduce than the 30 minutes we've had. So uh, what I would tell you is that um, um, you can switch back and forth. The way sw you switch back and forth between the method that you are familiar with and the method that we are trying to introduce now is, um, so you know, the result of this is going to complex number. So um, you should be asking the question of how does, uh, how does what does a complex charge mean? When I have a complex quantity here for the value of charge, like what does that mean? And physically what it means is that we are using complex number only as a mathematical, uh, mathematical convenience. So before you actually have a charge that you can call this is my charge, you have to imagine doing this. You have to imagine taking all this quantity, 
and putting it through real part function so that you are only taking the real part to mean your physically significant quantity. The imaginary part, tech, imaginary part there takes a long to make your calculus easy, but um, when you are ready to get your final physical charge, you take only the real part. So, uh, before, so you know, in order to be able to do that, you recognize that this Q0, really what this parameter here is the complex number, A plus IB. Or I guess if I want this to perfectly correspond to that, it'd be A minus IB. Then you can actually you know, expand this out using Euler's formula. And you will see that we do this understanding here. Uh, this is form of solution is exactly the same form of solution as this, where you are going to discard the imaginary part for your actual physically meaningful quantity. And um, I guess I had one cautionary note, but I don't think we have to spend too much time on it. Um, uh, let me just say this much. Um, so, so you will see the application of this more on Wednesday when we actually do AC circuits. But uh, let me give you uh, give this cautionary note for you um, so that you can never say that I didn't tell you. Um, so all of the uh, all the calculations that we are talking about so far, you can just go through this, and um, you will see more example of it on Wednesday, and it will be very simple. The complication comes in when you have squared quantities. So for example, when you are looking at energy stored in inductor. The expression for that is one half L, L, I think L I squared. This is energy stored in inductor, right? Or if you are looking at energy stored in capacitor, what that is, uh, um, one half Q squared over C, right? So if we are using this complex exponential, what you have to be really careful is to make sure that the quantity that goes in here, make sure that this quantity is the one where you took the real part of Q already. You already you take the real part and then square it. Because that answer you get that way looks different from the answer that you get this way. If you compare this with the one half, the complex Q squared, and then take the real part, it'll look different. You can actually go through the calculation, you know, express a Q of, uh, or the complex Q as the real plus IB, and it'll make a difference, whether you take the real part first and then square it, or you square it and then take the real part. Um, so, you know, that's something that uh, we would spend more time if this was the main thing we were doing in class. I'll just leave this as the cautionary note. So, uh, caution when multiplying to other function of time. When you are dealing with a constant coefficients like this, that's fine. It will actually all work out. But when you are multiplying to other functions of time, you have to be careful there. Yeah. Okay, so we'll use this tool uh, more on Wednesday, both to work out this uh, um, sorry LRC circuit and um, look at other AC circuits. I was hoping to cover this today, but I guess we don't have time. <laughs> so we'll do that on Wednesday.